Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here, coming at you from the Knife Center. Welcome to Knife AQ episode 163 of the Knife series, where I answer all your questions, sharp or dull. This week, we got a lot of questions from folks who are new to this here knife hobby, and we're going to give them a little bit of advice, a little bit of help. Let's get into it. All right, everyone, if you're new to this series, uh, what we do is the lifeblood of it is the questions that you leave in the comment section below. So keep them coming. If you've got a question that you think uh, would be interesting to hear an answer to on the air, so to speak, just leave it in the comments below and uh, it'll have a chance of getting picked for a future episode. First, this week is from Mode Shredden. Uh, hey DCA, I'm newer to collecting knives. This channel inspired me. Sorry. Excellent. Um, not sorry. <laughs> My question is, why do a lot of outdoor knives, quote unquote, use carbon steel instead of something more stainless? If you're in the elements, I feel like a stainless steel would be an asset. <clears throat> Corrosion resistance can certainly be an asset, um, but the, uh, the snarky answer that a lot of the, uh, the outdoorsy folks will give you is, well, just keep your blade clean and dry and you'll be okay. Um, but that's not my actual answer. That, that, that is the snarky answer that some will say though. Um, here we go. Here's a great example of a carbon steeled outdoor fixed blade, the LT Wright Gen 5 in A2 steel. Um, fixed blades, I feel like uh, they occupy a little bit of a different place in our imagination than a folding knife. Uh, they're a bit more old school. You've got that kind of rugged individualism idea wrapped up into, you know, an outdoor, you know, knife that you might, it might be the one thing you use to conquer the wilderness, conquer the, uh, or survive and all that. And fixed blades in a way are also truly made to work most of the time in a way that folders don't necessarily have to be. And by that, I don't mean folding knives can't work and work hard. It's just that they don't often have to work or they don't have to work as hard as often as the tasks that most fixed blades are called to do. That makes sense. Uh, <laughs> and because of that, toughness is a very prized characteristic, which is different from, you know, edge holding, uh, you know, toughness means less likely to chip and break, um, simplified terms, of course. And traditionally, historically, carbon steels have been tougher than most stainless steels, uh, up until, you know, recently, uh, in any case. And when I say recently, I'm talking about, you know, the last half to half to full century or, or thereabouts. So there's certainly a bit of kind of that old school, um, you know, appreciation when you, uh, you use a carbon steel uh, outdoor knife, you got a bit of that vintage aesthetic going on. Uh, and the other thing is cost. Um, most carbon steels um, are less expensive than, you know, exotic stainless powder metallurgy steels nowadays. Um, sure, there are simpler stainless steels you can get uh, in outdoor fixed blades too, but when you start to spend a bit more money on them, they tend to either be, you know, a classic carbon steel, even if A2 is not classic. A2 is a, pretty, a fairly uh, recent steel in terms of the broad range of things. I'm doing a lot of generaliz generalizing here, of course. Um, if this same blade were made out of Magna Cut or 3V, which actually 3V is not stainless, that defeats the purpose, but or defeats the point of the question, they're gonna cost more. The fixed blade genre is kind of a little bit more uh, insulated from the super steel arms race than uh, the, uh, the folding knife world has been because the stuff that uh, is used just plain works. And these are knives that are made to just plain work. So there's less of a demand maybe for them. I don't know, you folks tell me. Uh, but that would be my kind of personal take on why you see that a lot more often. You know, especially a lot of the uh, the bushcraft folks that I like to camp with, there's that emphasis and appreciation of the old school methods, technology, and everything else, primitive living uh, types of skills, and classic carbon steels go hand in hand with that sort of thing too. Anyway, hope that helps. Uh, next question is from Puerto Rican Boy 100. Any suggestions for first time pocket knife owners? I need something with a glass breaker and good steel for opening cans. Please help. I will help you and say, don't use your knife to open cans. <laughs> yes, it can be done, um, but it is a bit of a, a gimmick. 
Um, if you've got nothing else, certainly your, your knife blade will open a can. You can, you know, tap and hammer through and, and remove the can to get to the food on the inside. Uh, but inevitably, even on good steels, you could, you know, mess up your edge a little bit. And it's not exactly the safest way to open a can either. Um, so my first inclination would, would have been uh, something like a multi-tool with a can opener. Uh, I first thought of this Reek, uh, Rake Knives LD41 multi-tool that has a glass breaker built into the back right here. One problem with that, none of these tools actually have a can opener on them. They're like one of the few Swiss Army Knife style tools that kind of omit a can opener from their uh, list of implements, which normally I'd be very happy about because, you know, I think there's a lot of folks who don't necessarily need the can opener as often nowadays as much as you know another tool that might occupy the same place. But for the purposes of this question, it really annoys me because that w I thought that would have been a great answer. Um, so there's two ways you could go about this. I couldn't actually find a multi-tool um, that had both you know, a decent blade, a can opener, and a glass breaker on it. Folks in the comments, if you know of any, please let me know. I would love to, uh, love to find one. Uh, but until then, go about this two ways. One, you could get a Swiss Army knife. Whatever Swiss Army knife strikes your fancy, as long as it has the uh, can opener or their combo tool on it that also opens cans. And then you can get a, uh, an ink pen with a glass breaker built into the pen. That's one option, uh, but Instead of showing that, I'll just mention it. I've got something else because you know maybe you know a new pen uh, or a different pen than you already carry might not have a, a fit for you in your everyday carry. So what you should do, or what I would recommend doing, is I'll start with the can opening aspect. Get something like this stainless steel survival card. This one's about eight bucks on our site. Has a few implements built in, and it includes a can opener here right on the edge. And this can fit right in a credit card slot in your wallet. I'm assuming you carry a wallet and you might have some space in there for it. And you can also slip it into this little uh, vinyl case if you wish. You can take this uh, you know, little ball chain off if you want. That'll take care of your, uh, your can opening needs quite well without you know, taking up any extra pocket space than you probably are already committed to. And then get yourself any number of uh, rescue knives out there that come with glass breakers. Since you're talking about first time use, I've, or a first time buyer, I've got a very affordable one here for you to check out. This is the Kershaw Drivetrain. Hands down my favorite uh, inexpensive rescue style knife nowadays. We actually got it on sale for about 45 bucks right now. Uh, 3.2 inch blade, D2 steel, so you got plenty of edge retention in that price range. Only a semi stainless steel, so keep that in mind. Most folks don't have uh, too much of an issue keeping that from, uh, from rusting though, because it does have uh, some amount of chromium in it which is the element that is responsible for stainlessness, by the way. Glass breaker there on the end, so that is taken care of. And then you didn't ask for it specifically, but being a rescue knife, this also has a belt strap cutter right here as well, and it is locking. Comes out uh, just at a slight angle, which is nice, so you can hook in there, use the handle of the knife to cut with it. And that'll actually work on more than just uh, seat belts and that sort of things, uh, blister packs, you know, annoying packaging that uh, could be a little tougher on some other things. It's a nice option there. Assisted opening knife. So it flies open every time. Once you start opening the blade manually, it's just speed and consistency each time you need to use it. And it's just a great little shape for everyday carry. I would do that and urge you to, to not actually open cans with the blade of your knife unless you really, really absolutely have to. And even then be very careful. All right, next question comes from Michael Porterfield. Uh, always love the new knives of the week. Thank you. That's Thursday's video. If you're new uh, to this channel, this is the first video you're seeing every Thursday. Uh, we showcase the new stuff uh, that we've just gotten in here at the Knife Center. So you can check those videos out. <clears throat> I have a question, please. I want to purchase a Spyderco knife for under $100, and this will be my first purchase of a Spyderco knife. What would you recommend? Thanks in advance. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking for this, like what would be, what can you get for under $100 that like is quintessentially Spyderco, that something, it offers something that you're not gonna find in quite the same way somewhere else. Um, you know, like the Tenacious line and it's uh, larger and smaller brethren, I've always uh, trumpeted as a fantastic budget Spyderco model because it's a great design and it just plain works. But this is 
maybe similar, closer in similarity to what some other uh, knife manufacturers offer. I think for, for this price range, um, their long running lockback series is integral to the Spyderco DNA and like the, the historical brand experience. Stuff like the Delica, the Dragonfly, the Endura, that whole family. Um, and the Endella in that family is actually a fairly recent introduction to that lineup, uh, but it is the, uh, the largest that you can get for under that $100 price point at this point in time, so why not go with that, right? 98 bucks and some change for this. You've got a 3.4 inch blade. Uh, VG10, you've got a full flat grind, uh, a type of geometry you see across a broad range of different Spyderco models. The one hand opening hole, signature element of course. And the handle has a lot of kind of hallmark Spyderco features. They're well known for their uh, injection molded FRN handles here, the texture that they achieve with it. You've got their, they call it bi-directional texturing. You've got these angled directional peaks so that you've got you know, traction forward and backwards. So no matter which way you're cutting with this knife, you've got some grip. You've got a four position pocket clip as well. So you can carry it left or right, tip up or tip down, easy. Not very many knives out there offer this many different positions for clip carry nowadays. So that's always a cool thing. And then the mid mounted lockback. Uh, I don't know if they were the first to uh, move the lockback from the end here up to the middle, but they certainly I think more than any other manufacturer responsible for popularizing that placement. And it has a feature borrowed from knife maker David Boy called the Boy Dent, which does a couple of things. The primary purpose is to prevent accidental uh, closure or accidental disengagement of the lock, if you're like really bearing down on it, just to prevent any possible uh, accidents happening there. And also it can help you find that lock bar a little more easily because you've got that you know, difference in the line of the spine so you can find it real easy without even looking at it. So that's a cool thing. That's just a great size for everyday carry. 98 bucks and some change. Check that out. That'd be what I would do personally. The, uh, the only other ones that um, could fall in uh, to this category would be stuff like the Para 3 Lightweight. Um, with that, you would get a, uh, a proprietary uh, Spyderco lock, even though the patent has run out on that now. They used to be under $100, uh, but nowadays, actually did they? Now I'm doubting myself, because I'm, I'm looking right now, Thomas doesn't remember. Uh, I'm looking right now, the cheapest one of those is like 133 right now. Did those come in under 100 bucks when they were introduced, the lightweight versions? Go to the Wayback Machine. Let's go to the Wayback Machine. Somebody, uh, somebody let me know. I'm kind of doubt, that's a fairly big jump if it was. Uh, maybe it was like just over like 110 or something. Um, under a hundred bucks, you're not going to get, uh, any of their like signature lock, uh, mechanisms like the compression lock or the ball bearing lock, unfortunately. So we'll go with classic lock back in this case. All right. Now we come to the lightning round for today and I'm going to actually ask and answer the first question. Um, and this is, you know, what is the, the one piece of advice I would give to anyone new to the knife hobby? And I think this applies across the board, no matter what type of knife or what genre, what style, anything, whatever you're into, don't stress too much about steels and features and whether it's good enough for this or that. That's a small part of it, yes, but don't get too hung up on it. What you wanna do more than any of that, learn how to sharpen. And you will be a happier knife person, um, user, buyer, collector, whatever, for the rest of your life, if you know that simple skill, if you're not afraid to do it, uh, don't be afraid of you know touching up your edge. That's going to be the one thing I would recommend. To help achieve that, we have a whole playlist of uh, sharpening videos we've done. You can check that out for a primer, and I hope that helps for you. Next one comes from Tom Starkweather. That's our photographer here uh, at the Knife Center, and uh, he had a good uh, kind of question, first timer type of question for us. Um, it says, might be filed under dumb questions, but it's the first that comes to mind. How do you know when a knife is sharp? As in, what point do you stop sharpening? Easy answer here is once you've done it enough, you kind of know, but when you're getting the feel for it, um, some people kind of poo poo this as a testing method, but I say, Will it cut paper? Will it cut thin catalog paper, especially? That's what I really like to use. Um, but 
you know, if a knife is dull and you're sharpening, you can get it to cutting paper. Congrats, you're already better at that skill than 99% of the world's population. Uh, and so that is a great start. From there, you can keep progressing, keep going further, and you'll, you'll get to know when a knife is sharp enough for you. And that's, that's ultimately the answer. This is a very personal thing. How sharp is sharp enough? Depends on what you need, what you want, what you like. But get it to that paper, uh, paper slicing hardness or a paper slicing sharpness all the way across the edge consistently. And you can bring it up to hair shaving sharp from there. Once you get the feel for it, you'll figure out, uh, figure out what you need from there, I would think. But that's a good place to start. Thomas, you look like you have something to say. Oh. Okay, you just look like a, like a funny guy. I mean, instead. I did a sharpening video. <laughs> He's done many of these sharpening videos. Thomas has gotten better at sharpening over his time here at the Knife Center as well. I will give him credit for that. But that's all, it just takes practice. You know, I used to not be good at sharpening at all, like very much. Um, next question comes uh, in our lightning round from Dan Terror. Hey DCA, planning on getting my first pocket knife for EDC. My budget is up to $50 and I'm looking for something that isn't too big and aggressive looking. Do you have any suggestions for a beginner such as myself? Love the content by the way, thanks. Um, we did a video called uh, the best pocket knife for almost anyone at one point. We'll leave a link to that video. Uh, it's got some affordable options. I'm gonna show a video here, like some of those are gonna be great. I'm gonna show a knife here that actually would not meet the rules I set out in the video, but due to its popularity, the sales of this knife, the ubiquity of it, um, the company told us, or they sent out a, a press release indicating they actually built and sold their one millionth knife of this model, which is super impressive considering it's only a few years old. It's not too big, it's not too aggressive, it's a great EDC knife. And you've already guessed what it is. It's the Civivi Elementum. Uh, coming in these days, this is just under 50 bucks. We've got a couple versions on sale for even less. Um, it's basic, it's a three inch drop point. It's gonna do everything you need your basic pocket knife to do. That's the thing, like, Here's, that's the end of the lightning round answer, but I'm gonna you know, expound a little bit. Basic is not a bad thing. Basic is a very underrated quality in pocket knives nowadays, because basic works. This plane works. Uh, D2 steel on this blade, which is not the easiest to sharpen, but it does have a very thin edge, making it easier to sharpen, because you'd have to deal with less of it. But again, that falls back onto sharpening being the one important skill uh, that every knife person should know. Um, so I hope that helps. And now we come to our final question of the day, which is of course, our most serious question of the day. No joking. Jeremy too asks, uh, you are stranded in the deep forest. Well, he didn't ask, he states you're stranded in the deep forest. A pack of gray wolves meets you to eat you. Did I invite them like they're meeting me? Um, <laughs> Sorry, let's continue, no joking. Most serious. Uh, you lost your rifle a few days ago and your pistol jammed. What knife do you want? What did I just get done saying to these people? Sharpening is what's important, not the knife. As such, in this situation, you want something like this Lansky, the dog bone style sharpener. Offer these up to the wolves, that'll distract them a little bit, huh? Come on. Or they'll choke on it. Yeah, it's, it's true. But no knife, sharpen, there you go. Most important thing. And that's all we have for today, folks. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your most serious questions as well. Keep those coming too. Uh, let me know if you have any alternate suggestions for our folks down in the comment section. Or again, if you've got a question of your own and you wanna have it, uh, you want it to have a chance to be featured on a future episode, comment section is your friend, leave it down below. If you wanna get your hands on any of these things, you can check out the links in the description. That'll take you to knifecenter.com. And don't forget about our long running Knife Rewards program because the least thing we can do when you buy one of our knives today is give you some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center and that's Thomas behind the camera. We are signing off. See you next time.